And welcome to the World Economic Forum issue briefing coming to you from the annual meeting 2017 here in Davos Clusters. This is the issue briefing on human rights in a multipolar world. I'm absolutely delighted to have here uh, with us two distinguished guests and, uh, and human rights leaders. Uh, first here on my left, I have Z Zaid Rad Al Hussein, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights. And on his left, we have Salil Shetty, the Secretary General of Amnesty International. And the purpose of today's issue briefing discussion is to really have a, a challenging and provocative look at the state of human rights today. And we say human rights in a multipolar world, but we might also say human rights in a, po a polarized world, in an increasingly populist world, and in a world that's being disrupted and driven in many ways also by technology and what we here at the Forum have been talking about as uh, the fourth industrial revolution. So with that, we'll take about 20 minutes or 15, 20 minutes to discuss and get views from our distinguished panelists and turn to the, the audience uh, here in the room for, for some challenging questions to us. Um, I'd like to also welcome our viewers on, on Facebook and via live stream, and please do uh, uh, comment and suggest things as well, because this is an important public conversation to us to have. Zaid, as, um, as, as High Commissioner, obviously you're, you're, you, you have an important role globally at the international intergovernmental level to, to look at, understand and shape the state of human rights in the world. Where are we today, and where are we today, particularly in uh, in that multipolar uh, populist sentiment that we, we see feeling and, and occurring? Yeah. Uh, thank you, Nicholas. It's important to realize that uh, rights are almost like oxygen. Uh, you need it to maintain a semblance of a life, uh, and you take it for granted unless the why or until the rights are withdrawn from you. The system we have in place uh, was built on the embers of the suffering of hundreds of millions of people in the Second World War and in the First World War. And uh, it was created from that energy. Without the enormous suffering in the early part of the 20th century, we would not have been able to create it. The risk now is that notwithstanding the enormous achievements made across an uh, entire range of rights from the rights of women, the rights of children, the rights of persons with disabilities, the rights of the LGBTQ com uh, community. All of this now, I believe, is at risk. The proliferation of conflicts, the uh, attacks by extremist groups and terrorism, I mean, well understood and appreciated, the rise of autocratic governments, uh, unyielding in their acceptance of civil society that can exercise its civil rights properly, uh, and then uh, unleashed uh, also uh, is the um, rise of populism. And here we have to be extremely careful. There is this discussion uh, currently taking place here at the WEF that uh, basically builds into this idea that we have failed those who have, feel, uh, who have felt aggrieved, who have been left behind by shrinking labor markets, that economies have transformed countries into, uh, 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 or let's say parts of countries, w into angry population centers, those who feel that they, uh, that they have not participated in, in the share of the pie or have accepted it. The dangerous part of this thinking is that, yes, we need to do this, but not at the expense of doing the necessary thing of confronting the deceivers, the charlatans, uh, those who are cheating their people, the populace, uh, into believing that if you attack another vulnerable group, all your problems will be solved. We've been through this experience in the 20th century. It leads to catastrophic results. And this is the great fear that we have at the moment. Thank you, Zaid. Salil, Amnesty is an organization that is dedicated to confrontation of the human rights abuses in many ways, and the organization has, it works incredibly hard all around the world to, to do this every day. What, what's your sense of, of the state of human rights today and how Amnesty and others uh, at, in the NGO space are moving to, to really be more, more effective, uh, particularly in the changing circumstances and the fears that, that Zaid raised? I can, I can come to the question of what we are doing and how we are responding, but just in terms of what you know, the first part, you know, what's our kind of analysis, I think just to briefly touch on that, 
I think certainly it, it's at least been 10 years, if not longer, that many of us, including me individually, but Amnesty International organizations like Amnesty have been saying, including at the World Economic Forum annual meetings, that we are heading for a train crash. You know, and this has been a consistent message. And there are three fundamental reasons why we are heading for a train crash. Firstly, we have unaccountable governments and leaders. Secondly, we have growing inequality. And thirdly, we have failing institutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we've been saying this time and again, every forum, we ignore it. And, and you know, so we're not that surprised that this has happened, what we are, what we are seeing has happened now. Um, and it's, so since the last five, six years, we've had the Arab Spring. We've had, uh, you know, things like blowing up in Brazil, South Africa, as we speak. Um, and what's happened is that this space, this reality that people have genuine anger and outrage has been misused and hijacked by demagogues and populist leaders. And we are now caught napping when this happens. You know? so, uh, so we have Duterte, we have uh, in Philippines, we have Modi in India, we have Erdogan in Turkey, we have, and now of course, uh, Orban in Hungary, let's not forget Europe, closer home. And now we have uh, Trump in the US, Brexit in the UK, all of those things. So the question is, you know, what do we do? Where do we go from here? And for us, really, the solution actually is to go back to basics because there is no retreat on this question. So what we are being told is that in order to have security, uh, to protect the security of people, in order to have development, the solution is to basically dump human rights. That the way you provide security is by dumping human rights. The way you create development and growth is by not having human rights. Actually, it's quite the opposite. The reason we ended up in this situation and we ignored all the early warning signs is uh, what's caused the problem. So we have turned it around. And so for an organization like Amnesty International, which is a people's movement, it's based on 7 million uh, activists on the ground, uh, we're just going to go deeper to build the movement, to go back to this basic question as to why do human rights matter? You know, Why do checks and balances matter? In, in this real in the current reality and I'm sure we'll talk more in the context of the fourth industrial revolution as well so two interesting dichotomies you set up there so the the shift of anger and the expression of that anger in populist movements and yet the fear that those populist movements actually create this un undermining of a system that came out in 1948 after the, the the second world war and the second one being this false dichotomy between security and human rights which would suggest that we may be entering a period of a, a, um, a, a kind of a, a, a vicious um, reinforcing spiral of more security, worse human rights, uh, worse uh, security, etc. But Salil, you also mentioned failing institutions. So maybe something provocative to the, the High Commissioner, Said. You know, is it that the, that the High Commission itself, that the international institutions around human rights are failing, or, or, or what? What else is here at the heart of how we need to approach and ensure that human rights really serves to protect? Uh, and support uh, and go against the neglect and abuse by governments of people. Um, if I can take a leaf from Celia's book, uh, I've been coming to the World Economic Forum on and off for the last 15 years or so, and seldom if, if ever did I ever see in any of the literature from the World Economic Forum, or indeed in any of the panels, even the two words human rights mentioned they seem to be somehow toxic and the economists would prefer to talk about all-inclusive economies and then the subsets of human rights, uh, the rights of women, the rights of children and so forth. And the, the idea that you can mention human rights seems to be at variance with the aims of uh, the corporate world, the business world, and it's not, not the case. I, I, I commend the World Economic Forum to just you know, having this panel and ha talking about this issue because Salil is absolutely right. You, you, there are a number of countries that can post uh, good numbers when it comes to their, um, to their economies. Uh, uh, low rates of debt, uh, low uh, debt to GDP ratio when it comes to the current account, uh, uh, good uh, foreign currency reserves. But you know that if the head of state of that country were to suffer a stroke, within three or four months, it'll be in turmoil because the rights part of it was just not there. And as Salil said, it, sort of, it surprises us that economists are surprised that we've gone through this because we have detected it. That human, human rights is a very sensitive se seismograph. 
And we pick things up very early. And again, you're not aware of rights until you begin to lose them. And, and the people that support Salil's organization are the first ones to sort of sense this. And so we, we think it is appropriate. In terms of the institutions, I mean, we, we, there's a considerable amount of discussion about Brexit. Uh, uh, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom spoke yesterday. She's here in Davos today. Uh, but uh, we have seen in the past a threat uh, made to the United Nations of wholesale withdrawal of membership. We've seen it with the International Criminal Court. We've seen it with the Regional Human Rights Commission, the Inter-America Commission. We've seen the UK at one stage threaten to withdraw from not just the European Court of Justice, but the European uh, um, uh, Convention on Human Rights. And, and this is something new. This is a, an acknowledgment that somehow these institutions, this set of laws doesn't serve the public anymore. And Salil is absolutely right. I mean, they were put in place because we recognize that in the end, if you don't pay attention to this, you end up in a sort of, not in a literal sense, but you end up in Sarajevo. You end up either Sarajevo 1992, where you have these vicious regional wars, or you end up in Sarajevo 1914, something much greater. But that's where the density of hatred takes you at the very uh, end of the, of the road. If you take the UN Security Council, right, which, was, which is supposed to be the paramount body in the world set up to ensure peace and security, those five countries are behind most of the wars. They are the biggest arms traders and manufacturers in the world. And they are busy playing politics. And so at a minimum, we're saying that don't use the veto, at least when it comes to crimes against humanity, you know, serious crimes of that nature. So, and, and the populist question, just to go back briefly to that, you know, the, the challenge we have now is that since they can't find a solution to the real issues, what they're doing is scapegoating, creating fear. So if you're a Muslim, you're a refugee, you're a migrant, you know, uh, or now if you're a woman as well. So you're just being attacked for being the other. And that's the big challenge we're facing. But we're, the only way to s deal with this is to fight it head on. So that's what we're gonna do. So let's talk more about fighting and helping to reform in different ways. The kind of the, the confrontation element here that we, we mentioned earlier, calling out human rights abuses and those that enable it, and the way in which we need to build institutions or reform institutions to actually have that, um, that kind of that peaceful runway to, to provide the oxygen that Zaid said of, of human rights in, in everywhere. High Commissioner, in, in what ways, what ways do, we, do we need to fight and what's the responsibility of those privileged enough to be here at Davos who are representing major corporations, uh, large members of the civil society community, the, the media, many of whom are, are watching this um, here in the room and online, and other stakeholders. What's our responsibility as individuals and, and organizations to, to fight? Uh, the important point is that uh, we do not become meek and do not resort to general statements. It's easy to say that we're all against xenophobia, that we're all against prejudice, and we're all against discrimination. The hard thing is actually to name who the xenophobes are, and then to speak to them directly. And we've seen time and again that uh, people can be very courageous in private and, and not so in public. Uh, too much is at stake now, and we, we need to, if we're going to speak about xenophobia, we have to name who we believe the xenophobes to be and be clear about it. And I think both of us have done this and, and we will continue to do it. Um, and uh, from the corporate side, I think there's a recognition, again, that we need greater precision when it comes to analysis. For instance, a couple of years ago, there was a, a very important conference that was convened in London to look at sexual, sexual and gender-based violence, uh, a, an odious phenomenon um, that needs to, be, needs to be dealt with. And much of the attention was focused on the appalling conditions in the Eastern Congo. Uh, when I was there recently, and I think Salil has been many times, and I asked the question, how much of it is incidental? How much of it is just these wild sort of armed groups that uh, commit these horrific abuses against women time and again? And I was told that uh, we don't have the data as such, but anecdotally, it's not believed to be incidental or sporadic. It's believed to be programmed at the behest of or to curry favor with the corporations that are mining in that part of the country. So in London, to my knowledge, I didn't see those companies represented. Now, whether they know or don't know, they should be there because the impl implication is 
that these armed groups are, are doing this somehow uh, in, in a way that, that um, uh, no control can be exercised over them. And we believe that corporations, for instance, need to be involved. But we're not there to beat them over the head with a stick. We're there because we need them to help us solve the problem. And if they're not there, we're only dealing with half the problem and not, in a genuine sense, uh, trying to solve it. Thank you. Salil. I, mean, I think there's, there's a massive role for business leaders who are here in Davos to play. And, and again, it's not new stuff. You know, we're saying that before you launch on stuff, you, on any of your projects, it has to be part of your core business thinking that you need an ex ante. You know, before you launch into it, you have to do a proper assessment of what the human rights impacts are going to be. Just like you do with the environment, you have to do that in relation to societies. Um, and of course, the extractives are the big one. But coming to the technology question, you know, if the big corporate tech companies cannot ensure encryption, and the human rights defenders are then exposed, they're attacked. We know that. You know? So, I mean, encryption is not like a, it's a technological thing, but it's actually a very serious political issue. Absolutely. Well, that brings us nicely on to the issue of technology, uh, the, the number, the diffusion of technology, the rate of change of technology, and the ways in which uh, different uh, groups, governments, of course, but corporations, non-state actors, uh, others are able to use and employ technology for, for different purposes. Uh, I think there's, there's two issues at play here. One is the misuse or, a, or, or, or use of this technology f to, to further human rights abuses. And the other one, uh, the other issue is just that it changes the context in which we are able to uh, detect and understand and appreciate and, and, and make impact in the general sphere of protecting vulnerable people when their rights are being neglected or, or abused. Salil, just to, f to follow up on this, how do you feel technology has changed the context in which amnesty has worked, and, and, and has it affected or, or, or made it worse or better in different ways? You know, I always say that if you think about liberation theology and all the great things that liberation theology did to the Catholic Church, I think we're now talking about liberation technology. You know, that there's, the power is amazing, and it's, it's done wonders to empower people. I mean, the mobile phone, in some ways, has empowered more women. Uh, than most organizations could imagine doing, including Amnesty. So all of the positives I take as a given, we are using it for crowdsourcing, for sat we're using satellite imagery. You know, we've just had a million people sign a petition to pardon Snowden. We couldn't have done that digitally uh, without having digital support. But you know, I say this, the four areas in which we really need to be cautious in terms of safeguards, one is the issue of technology and freedoms. So you now have Apple, pulling the New York Times app in, in uh, China. So what does that mean? You know, so the whole access to information, the role of corporates there is, is massive, and encryption privacy is one of the sub-issues there. Second is dignity. You, know, you have trolling, you have abusers. 75% of women are saying that they're facing cyber violence. I mean, this is massive. Mm -hmm. uh, the third is on jobs, so the whole issue of equity. Um, of course, we need technology, but you know, if you're not conscious of the fact that this has a very asymmetric results, then it's, it's going to be very, very big. Um, so, I, and I think the final issues on peace, you know, technology and peace. So, use of drones, use of predictive policing. I mean, it's not like playing video games. You know, people are dying. We've done groundwork in Pakistan and places like that, Yemen, as we speak. You know, the use of. So, there's a whole issue of what role positive and negative technology can play on peace and security. So I think we just need to be very conscious of these issues. Of course, we want to move ahead. But how are you moving ahead is the question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Said, what's your take on this on technology and human rights at the moment? No, I, I mean, I, I add I mean, my voice completely to what Salil has said. Um, I think it's important to realize that, that the background conditions in many countries uh, are, can be sort of described as pretty serious, to say the least. You know, deep structural discrimination exists in many of these countries. And uh, the uh, prevalence of, of technology can widen the, the gap. Um, it, it is debatable to what extent it is a real leveler because it can just expose the prejudice to even deeper forms of articulation. Um, and so it is not, I think both of us agree, it's not entirely a panacea. You do need, if you're going to have all-inclusive development, sustainable development, you do need for the elites in countries to recognize patterns of discrimination against minorities, against ethnic groups who have been excluded, against indigenous groups who are often marginalized. And it's only with this transformation of the mind 
that you can then use technology for the, benefit, for the benefit of all your people. If you do not open your mind up to this way of thinking, then it's extremely dangerous. And I've oft, often been asked, you know, you, know, you uh, sort of liberal types, uh, are you not passé now? Are you not a sort of a beleaguered group because uh, the, the, you're, you're being passed by? And my response is, uh, that may be so in the minds of some, but those of us who have been in conflict, and I spent two years in the former Yugoslavia 20 years ago, you see where it takes you at the end. We know what the destination is. It's not a joking matter. And I think uh, more and more corporations, the more they have this discussion with us, uh, the human rights movement, I think the better it is. There is one other point I'd like to make, and that is that the people we talk to, so I had a, uh, uh, did a Facebook chat live uh, two months ago. Uh, we had a very strong response. Most of the people who were asking questions were young people. And they are concerned about rights issues. They really are. And if you are a corporation that wants to think in terms of market share in the future, you are a smart corporation if you think about values and if you think about rights, not just in the supply and the value chain, but the vision statement and what you represent, because then you're on the right side. What we see happening is clearly a challenge to human rights, but we think the long arc is there. And sort of in the end, you know, hope uh, will trump fear. And I use the word, middle word purposefully. Uh, hope will trump fear. And uh, it's, it's, the liars can lie for only a certain amount of time. In the end, I think the historical record proves that they do not succeed, either in reputational terms or even indeed of their own uh, experience. Can I say, make one Please. thing, you know, concretely, because you know, you're talking about business leadership, responsible leadership. So the UK has now come up with uh, investigative powers law which is probably one of the most invasive surveillance legislation that's come anywhere in the world. So you can imagine what Ethiopia and all these other countries are going to do uh, since the UK is a role model for many of these uh, police states. Uh, so where is the business voice in the UK saying, no, you know, this is not, this is irresponsible, we're going to challenge this. In Europe, not very far from here, we have tens of thousands of refugees freezing in the cold and living in camps in miserable conditions, the richest continent on the planet, is abusing its own refugee convention, which it has signed up to. Where is the business voice saying, this is gross abuse, we cannot allow this to happen? Well, thank you both. I think it's time to turn to the audience. We have 10 minutes left, and we want to make sure that we reserve that time for questions and debate from, from those of you here in the, in the room. Um, so if I could uh, ask you to identify yourselves and uh, put your hand up, we'll, we'll get a microphone to you. and. Uh, please do feel free to be, be, be challenging, be, be provocative, um, but do be concise, and we'll see how many questions we can get before we ask uh, Zaid and Salil to do a, a, a closing statement. So who would like to start us off in terms of a, a short comment or a question from the audience for the panelists to respond to? Yes. Both of you said the institutions are failing to do their job. Um, what can regular citizens and individuals in the United States, for example, it's pretty clear we do not agree with Trump and his statements and his uh, discrimination. So what can regular citizens do to cooperate or collaborate with organizations like yours? Um, it's a question that we uh, frequently um, uh, have to deal with in many parts of the world. And uh, the uh, response is always, you know, you exercise your uh, freedom of expression when you have it. It's when you lose it or have lost it, it's too late for you almost. You use it when you have it uh, to make the points that will have impact because uh, as one of my predecessors said, the, the space between a government and its people is a very narrow space, but it's a, the most sensitive space as well. And, and we know that when we criticize the government by name and they brush us off, it's, it's not truthful that it has an impact because it elicits a reaction. And the more we do it, the more there is a reaction. And ordinary citizens need to be aware of what their rights are. Many of them don't know because until they disappear. And then once you know what the rights are and the rights of others, defend them 
speak, use your voice to, to do this. You would be amazed how many human rights defenders around the world are willing to risk everything for the, for the, the, the sake of speaking on behalf of principle. And they forfeit their, their families almost, their lives, they're stuck in miserable prison conditions for years, but they will speak out. And if they can do it, everyone can do it. And I think that's the point that has to be driven out. I mean, for Amnesty, this is kind of our core business. In some ways, we are a people's movement. We have more than 7 million activists and campaigners from different parts of the world. We take no money from governments or companies to do our research campaigning because we have to remain independent, impartial. So Amnesty wouldn't exist if people like you are not part of it. So, uh, and I mean, Amnesty is not the only organization. There are many people who work. The, the benefit of doing things in a collective is obviously much greater than doing it alone. But as Zaid said, that shouldn't stop you from doing things as yourself. Um, and yeah, we have like our two big pushes right now. One is on the refugee issue, and second is on the attack of human uh, attacks on human rights defenders. And when we say human rights defenders, it's not like those who are for fighting for technically for human rights. They could be fighting for environmental issues. They could be anti-corruption activists. Uh, you know, they're all under attack in so many parts of the world, uh, including in the U.S. So, so. Please, you know, um, our strapline is taking injustice personally. Mm -hmm. Don't wait for it to affect you, because it will sooner or later. That's right. Another question from the audience. Please, sir. I am uh, Bill Browder, <coughs> uh, CEO of Hermitage Capital Management and uh, head of the Magnitsky Global Human Rights Campaign. Um, uh, one of the things which, which you didn't mention in, in either of your presentations is the intersection between kleptocracy and abuse of human rights. Um, it seems that as leaders of, uh, many leaders of authoritarian regimes um, abuse their leadership to steal money um, and they abuse their people to stay in position to continue to steal money. And one of the things that, that um, we've discovered in the Magnitsky justice campaign is the use of targeted sanctions against human rights abusers. Um, if you find somebody who's abusing the rights in their country, um, it's pretty hard to get them to stop if they're profiting from it. <clears throat> but if you can freeze their assets in the West, then it does indeed um, create a great disincentive for, the, for them to do that. Um, I'm wondering from both of you um, what your organizations think about the use of targeted sanctions against um, kleptocrats and human rights violators, and whether that's a good policy, whether you would endorse that um, uh, for other countries. Oh, it's a great question, uh, William. And uh, uh, I regret to say this, is, this part of the work is an undeveloped, uh, so underdeveloped part of the work in, in my office. We have spoken about it, that we need to focus more on, on corruption and the capture of the political space by elites because it, you have this uh, situation in many countries where, uh, and this uh, terminology came out of the Center for International Development at Harvard, uh, which are not really countries. They, they're referred to as isomorphic mimicry. Uh, in other words, they mimic countries. They appear to be countries. Every investment is made into the appearance of a country, but the institutions don't really exist because this nexus or this joint enterprise between the political elites uh, who have captured the political system and then corruption is, is so deep. It's something that I have to confess we need to focus more on and look uh, deeper into. Uh, but that it is an issue, I think, is, is uh, beyond dispute. Uh, the more you travel to uh, around the world, the more you, you see uh, evidence of this. Um, in terms of uh, targeted sanctions, they do seem to work in certain uh, situations. Um, again, it seems to be anecdotal. We hear. Uh, in uh, specific circumstances were it not for targeted sanctions, um, you then uh, it would not, the, the situation would not have changed. This, for instance, uh, perhaps has relevance to the DRC at the moment, with the decision taken by um, President Kabila on the 31st of December. They don't seem to have worked in the case of Burundi, and we need to understand you know, why is this the case? The U.S. Uh, makes, makes the argument under the Obama administration that they came too late too early or too late, depending on how you see it. Um, so it is something that we need to study um, in a deeper sense. We've just got one minute left, so maybe Salil, okay. in answering Bill's question, in answering your question, we can also talk about if there are any other kind of calls for 
um, how we can be innovative in the way that, that uh, Bill and his group are in terms of uh, making a difference in human rights. No, so I mean, on, on the corruption question, there's no no doubt. I mean, international human rights law, it's a bit complicated, the relationship with corruption. The, you know, legally speaking, it's a hazy kind of mm. uh, picture. But leaving it on the legality of it, I think for most ordinary people, it's obvious. The connections are obvious. Uh, it erodes, you know, independent media, judiciary. So most of these countries which I named, they are in the process of decimating institutions. They either bribe them, they bully them, they intimidate them or you know it's a straight corruption that's happening so it's a combination of all of that sanctions you know we uh, yeah i think the question is how do you get smart targeted sanctions to work it's a, it's a slightly mixed bag like we've called on asset freezes in the case of say assad's uh, and his immediate coterie so we call out for that sometimes when it's clear that it, it's important and we can it'll make a difference there are other times when we are a bit careful about it because we're not sure it's a blunt instrument so we don't want to harm people as well um, but I mean, if you're asking me beyond that, I, I think the, the thing is it's, it's time for, you know, that's what we always say that the, the only time things get bad and evil takes over is when good people are silent and inert. So it's time for us to get into the battle and, you know, fight it together. Thank you very much. I think we're just coming up to the time here. So I wanted to thank both uh, Zayal Dadar al Hussain uh, and uh, Salil Shetty um, for their, their time here, as well as all of you here in the room. Um, I'll just mention again, human rights exist to protect people against abuse and neglect by governments and other institutions. As Zaid said, they are the oxygen that, that we breathe. Thank you so much for taking the time to raise this issue with us at the World Economic For Forum here in Davos in, in 2017. Thank you to the audience, and, uh, and please, I, I wish all of you a fantastic week uh, and all the opportunities to, to protect and support the most vulnerable people in the world as we move forward. Thank you, everyone.